bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today we're going to be talking about pediatric chronic pain and we're going to be introducing you to the CAFC, CAFC's Chronic Pain Toolkit, and we're going to be using a, a case study to help support that introduction. So it's my pleasure to welcome our team that come to us from across the country, uh, but all of our uh, panelists today are part of the uh, CAFC Community of Practice for Children's Pain. Uh, this community of practice started about five years ago, and today is going to present what I think is their sort of their final piece of work uh, in, in their sort of journey to develop resources related to children's pain, this one related to chronic pain. But if you go to the Community of Practice section on our on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network at ken.cafc.org. You can see all of their other work uh, compiled there, much of it having already been presented here on our webinar series. So you can certainly go to the to the uh, webinar archive and see any of those previous webinars related to children's pain. They've had presentations on acute presenting pain or resources in that section on acute presenting pain, acute procedural pain, and lots of other resources. So be sure to check all of that information out uh, on the Ken, uh, once again at ken.cafc.org uh, following this webinar. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our panel. Um, we have three presenters today. Uh, first, we have Ashley Townley, who is a knowledge broker with the Evidence to Care team, uh, the knowledge, which is the knowledge translation hub at Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in Toronto. She's also co-chaired the, pa the pain community of practice along with Dr. Samina Ali of Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton uh, for the last two years, supporting the movement of high quality research evidence on pediatric pain into the hands of our community members. We also have Kathy Reed, who's a nurse practitioner with the Pediatric Chronic Pain Service at Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. She uh, also does research in this area, which includes uh, the development of an e-book for families whose children have chronic pain. Understanding, She also does research uh, helping understanding the parental perceptions of the quality of their child's post-operative pain management. And finally, we have Sandy Smink, who is the president of the ILC Chronic Pain and Ehlers-Danlos Charitable Foundation. Uh, the ILC is, has a dedicated focus to children and youth in its community-based support programs for individuals living with chronic pain and hereditary connective and the hereditary connective dis tissue disorder, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So it's my pleasure to hand to first off hand the virtual podium over to Ashley Townley. Over to you, Ashley. That's great. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone that's joining us today. Um, like Doug said, my name is Ashley and I work at Holland Blurview. Um, and uh, my role has really been to support um, getting the information that our community me members so need and want um, into shareable modes like toolkits. Um, so today, what we are going to share with you is just a brief history of the pain community of practice um, and, and what we um, done to date. Um, we'll turn it over to Sandy to really set the stage and talk about a family story and how that relates to chronic pain. Then we'll go to Kathy and she's going to help us navigate the toolkit using a case study approach so you can decide which elements of the toolkit may be appropriate for your context. We're going to take a brief look at some of the family resources that we have that as a clinician you may want to share with some of the families and patients that you work with. And then um, we'll go to uh, a bit of a call to action. So how can you support the chronic pain work? What can you do? So a 
community of practice represents a group of professionals informally bound to one another through exposure to a common class of challenges and common pursuit of solutions. So starting five years ago, the Capsi Pain COP um, has been, really been a group of dedicated, passionate pain experts and advocates looking to change the pediatric pain landscape by sharing knowledge and experience. From the start, we aimed at focusing on three key areas of pediatric pain, acute procedural pain, acute presenting pain, and finally, chronic pain. I'm happy to report that over our years together, we have been able to address all three areas. We have developed toolkits in 2017 and 2018 um, that we have shared over these various webinars with you that compile current research knowledge, expert advice, practical resources, and tools for clinicians and resources to support the patients and families that you see in your practice. This information has been made available um, online on the Knowledge Exchange Network um, to the CAPC and broader healthcare community. So I'm both thrilled and quite sad to report that the pain community of practice is wrapping up um, as CAPC goes through a new funding cycle. That doesn't mean that our content is going anywhere um, or, you know, that we're, we're dropping off the face of the earth. The, the content will continue to live in the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, and we continue to be open um, to recommendations for additional resources to add. Having said that, it is a new and exciting time for CAPC, and there are several new areas of focus that they're going to be looking at going forward. These are Indigenous health, mental health, and transitions across the continuum of care. We don't know exactly um, what the community of, pra uh, community of practice opportunities will be within these new areas of focus, but please continue to stay tuned and we will get back to you. So to set the stage, I'd now like to turn it over to my colleague, Sandy Sneak, to talk about a family story and chronic pain.
Thanks, Sandy, for showing that video. So, um, yeah, I'm Kathy Reed. I'm a nurse practitioner here at the Celery Chronic Pain Program, and I've been working in chronic pain for uh, just about 10 years now. So um, I want to just talk to you a little bit about how to go through the toolkit and how to use the toolkit. And we would really encourage you to give us some feedback on the toolkit as to whether or not it's meeting your needs. We, we hope it is, and we'd love to hear from you as to how effective you find it. Um, I want to introduce a case study um, of a very common uh, chronic pain condition using um, some of the illustrations from our book that I'll show you in a few minutes. So I'd like to introduce you to Amanda. So Amanda is a 14-year-old who's in your clinic. You're probably in a primary care clinic somewhere, or perhaps you're in an emergency department. Um, she comes in with her mother, Lucy, and uh, you look at her chart and see that this is her third visit in the past six months for headache. In addition, um, she was at last appointment, she was seen for abdominal pain. And when you check further into her chart, you can see that she's had two visits to the emergency department for pain. So when we look at the epidemiology of chronic pain, it's kind of all over the map. There was a good study by Sarah King's group out of the Toronto, uh, approximately 2011, that really looked at how common chronic pain is. Headache and abdominal pain would be the most common causes of chronic pain. Um, and multiple pain sites, so pain in more than one area of the body is up to 48% of kids. So kids will come um, talking about pain in multiple areas are, of the body. Most of us kind of ballpark about a one in five um, incidence of children having a chronic pain condition, so approximately 20% of kids. Now, not all of those kids are quite disabled by that pain. Approximately 3 to 5% of kids would have um, life going sideways because of pain, and that includes things like difficulty going to school, difficulty with sleep, um, difficulty with keeping up with their peers, um, maintaining their activities, those sorts of things. Um, so when does pain become chronic? When do we decide that pain has become a chronic disease? So what I would have you look at first is as you navigate through the toolkit here, you will see that we have put the pages together of a start here and then go through. So I always encourage people to look at the American Pain Society statement. It's a brief four page statement. The upload is here. And when you open it up, it's just a nice four pager that explains the significance of chronic pain in kids, um, what kind of things may happen to them because of this pain, the costs that the child and the family are here. And really, I encourage everyone to look at that definition. When does pain become chronic? We have chosen, those of us who work in pain, have chosen an arbitrarily three to six month time period and that goes for children as well as adults and it's really looking at pain that's persisting beyond the expected healing time so someone's had a tissue damage they've had a surgery they've had an injury and they continue to have pain um, it can then develop into this chronic persistent or recurrent pain syndrome and when we look at what we're defining it is we have to look at that integration of the biological processes because all pain has a biological process it's not in their heads, but it is in the brain. There are some psychological factors that make pain more difficult to manage, and there's some sociocultural factors that make pain more difficult for kids to manage, such as missing school and missing activities. And then, of course, we have to look in the developmental trajectory, how kids communicate our, their pain um, increases as they, they grow older. Certainly, it's difficult to determine chronic pain in a two-year-old when we're looking at behaviors in a child who's preverbal versus a teenager who can tell you exactly what their pain feels like and where it is. Um, this category of pain, as we said, incur includes both ongoing and recurrent episodic pain. And, and certainly we see pain in a lot of children who have other chronic health conditions, such as arthritis, sickle cell. Um, and then we see pain that's a disorder itself, such as the headaches, the migraines, functional abdominal pain, complex regional pain syndrome. Um, how do we assess pain? Um, it really, really, really comes down to doing that good history, taking a good history and doing a physical examination. And I can't stress enough the importance of doing that physical examination. So when you look on the second page of this uh, um, letter, it talks a little bit about what to do in the initial evaluation. So do that complete medical and pain history and asking those pain questions and giving children the time to answer. The question should be asked to the older kids and then the parents can contribute as well. So asking things like, when did it start? How severe is it? What does it feel like? What does your pain feel like to you? Where is it in your body? How long have you had it? And how long does it last when you have your episodes? 
How variable is it? How do you have it every day? Do you have it all day? Is it worse in the morning, worse in the evening? How predictable is it? Do you know when you're going to have pain or do you not? What makes it worse? What causes your pain? And what things have you tried that helps to manage your pain? So just asking those simple questions and giving people time to answer is really, really quite important um, to be doing that comprehensive pain history. And again, as I said, doing that physical examination as well. It's also important to do some psychological, psychosocial assessment of the child and the family. How are they coping? Uh, what's their emotional functioning like? Uh, what does it affect um, their daily life, such as their sleeping, their eating, social, school, physical, those sorts of things. Completing that physical and neurological examination. What, what do they look like? Do their posture? Do their gait? Um, do their um, vital signs, do your cranial nerve, ex uh, your uh, nerve examinations, um, those sorts of things are really, really important to do on the first evaluation. And again, if there's red flags, doing some appropriate uh, lab and radiology studies if a specific disease is suspected, such as arthritis. Um, another area that you can look at for assessing kids is the RNAO best practice guidelines, and they are listed here on the um, the page on the web, but I went to the, it's 180 pages, 105 pages, so page 85 that really looks at some of the things that you can use for multidimensional tools for kids. Um, the brief pain inventory has a body um, map included on it so they can put on a, a where they hurt and then they have that uh, pain assessment scale. Um, so that's one that would be useful to use. The um, unidimensional tools are really good for acute care. They're not as much good at, for um, kids with, with chronic pain, but you can ask the severity. And there's a couple of severity tools that you can use there. Um, again, I can't stress enough, though, the importance of doing that thorough history and the physical examination. How do I explain chronic pain to the child and the family? I hear from a lot from kids that they've seen a lot of healthcare providers and yet they still don't understand what pain is, what's happening in their body. So there's been a couple of good um, links that I'll show you here in the toolkit that can help with this. One of them is the chronic pain is like, which comes from the uh, pediatric um, pain letter. And again, if you go on to here, we have the link to the pediatric pain letter here. It's an open access letter. You can read it. There's tons and tons of letters. It's done three or four times a year. So the, the pediatric pain newsletter, this one was done in 2013, and it's chronic pain is like, and it's a really good little article that's been done by several of the experts in the world on pediatric pain on using the analogies and the metaphors to explain pain to children. So uh, the differences between acute and chronic pain um, you know, the idea of that doorbell that goes haywire, you press the doorbell, it rings in the house, um, the doorbell's ringing like every, like all the time, all day, all night from, from Susan Tupper, it's like the alarm clock that goes off, you hit the snooze button, but it doesn't shut off and it continues to fire off or like the car alarm, we've all been a parkade where the car alarm goes by, the truck passes or somebody vibrates the car alarm goes off, but no one's breaking into the car. And some of those car alarms are really, really sensitive. One of the things the teens really like is, is you know, if they're, they're techie, we talk about it being the software failure. It's not something wrong with a hard drive in your computer. It's a software failure. And so our body is the hardware and the software is the nervous system that sends that message. So those are a couple of really good analogies that we like to use for the kids. And now I will get you to just show briefly a video that's available here on uh, underneath our videos on explaining pain. It is for adults, I will tell you, but it's a very, very good one that a lot of us have been using. It's the understanding pain in less than five minutes. Everyone agrees that pain is a universal human experience. We now know that pain is 100% of the time produced by the brain. This includes all pain, no matter how it feels, sharp, dull, strong or mild, and no matter how long you've had it. You might have had it for a few weeks or months. This is called acute pain, and it's common with tissue damage, say from a back injury or ankle sprain. And generally, you'll be encouraged to stay active and gradually get back to doing all your normal things, including work. Or you might have had it for three months or more, and this pain is generally called persistent or chronic, because in this type of pain, tissue damage is not the main issue. 
What's less clear, though, is when you're told you have chronic pain, is knowing what's best to do about it. Well, in Australia, chronic pain is a really big problem. In fact, one in five people have it. Having a brain that keeps on producing pain, even after the body tissues are restored and out of danger, is no fun. Some people say it still feels like they must have something wrong. But that's just it. Once anything dangerous is ruled out, health professionals can explain that most things in the body are healed as well as they can be by three to six months. So ongoing pain being produced by the brain is less about structural changes in the body and more about the sensitivity of the nervous system. In other words, it's more complex. So to try and figure out what's going on, you need to retrain the brain and nervous system. To do this, it's helpful to look at all the things that affect the nervous system and may be contributing to your individual pain experience. What can help is to look at persistent pain from a broad perspective and by using a structured approach and a plan, it's less likely that anything important will be missed. Let's start with the medical side. Firstly, taking medication can help but only to a limited extent. It is the more active approaches that are necessary to retrain the brain. So using medications to get going is okay, and then mostly they can be tapered and ceased. Some people also think surgery might be the answer, but when it comes to a complex problem like chronic pain, surgery may not be helpful. So if you're thinking of surgery, it's best to get a second opinion and remember to consider all the things. Next, it is helpful to consider how your thoughts and emotions are affecting your nervous system. Pain really impacts on people's lives and this can have a big effect on your mood and stress levels. All those thoughts and beliefs are brain impulses too, but you can learn ways to reduce stress and wind down the nervous system. This helps with emotional well-being and can reduce pain as well. The third area to consider is the role of diet and lifestyle. Now it turns out that our modern lifestyle might not be so good for us. In fact, what we eat and how we live may really be contributing to a sensitised nervous system. Looking at all the things like smoking, nutrition, alcohol and activity levels and seeing if there are any issues is a good beginning, and these things can go on your plan. Then there's often enormous value in exploring the deeper meaning of pain and the surrounding personal story by stepping back and looking at all the things that were happening around the time the pain developed. Many people with pain can make useful links between a worrying period of life and a worsening pain picture. For many, recognising deeper emotions can be part of the healing process. Last, but by no means least, is physical activity and function. From the brain's perspective, getting moving at comfortable levels without fear and where the brain does not protect by pain is best, and you'll gradually restore your body's tissues. So, to sum up pain, it comes from the brain and it can be retrained, and when looked at from a whole person or broad perspective, gives you a lot of opportunities to begin. So, get a helping hand if you need it, set a goal, and begin. It's good. It's been um, done from the Australia group. Um, there is also a couple of really good ones out of the German um, group, um, Boris Dornikow's group in German, um, that are done in English, though. So the Understanding Pain in 10 Minutes is a good one that's more pediatric focused that people can look at as well. Um, we've also put together um, some books. We have our book that is on here somewhere. I'll find it in a second. Um, there's two recommended textbooks that are there for healthcare professionals. I can tell you the Oxford textbooks being redone now. So there will be a new edition coming out in 2019. And the Managing Pain in Children um, was from 2014. We've also created our book that's looking at 
um, understanding pain from the families story um, that you can download. It's an ebook. We also have um, versions of it um, that are recorded so you can listen to the story as well. So again, these are done to try and help people understand um, what's happening in the body in chronic pain and more importantly, how to engage in some helpful strategies. Um, as a care provider, how, how can you learn more? Well, we're very happy to uh, note that Sick Kids has put together an absolutely fabulous free webinar-based online um, pediatric pain. Um, um, sorry, I lost my link to that. Too many links open. Um, they've put on their, their their Sick Kids online pain curriculum that you can go through on your own. There are several modules for anyone in the world who can go in to do them, uh, starting with the neurobiology of pain. There is a chronic pain um, one that's been done as well that you can go through. You can go through the module and have a look. There's learning objectives. There's the module. It's And it's, again, through a case study. So I encourage everyone who's interested in learning more about assessing and managing pain to try the module as well. So let's get back to Amanda. So again, we have our 14-year-old who's coming to you to see you about pain. I can't stress enough the importance of helping them understand the explanation of pain and validating their pain. There's nothing worse. The kids tell me all the time, there's absolutely nothing worse than coming and saying, nobody believed me. No one uh, listened to me. Nobody trusted my pain. One of my uh, teenagers actually wrote a poem and two lines from the poem that she's given me permission to share are, will they believe me? Will they trust my pain? So give them a good explanation. And then what we can do is also look at some of the resource-specific um, toolkits that we've put together in here for chronic pain. So if we go back to the beginning of the toolkit, so you've seen that we have the toolkit. Um, we do have some condition-specific resources that we've tried to put together for you. This is by no means complete, so if anybody wants to add more, please feel free to do it. But we've addressed some articles with regards to complex regional pain syndrome, functional abdominal pain, headaches, and the hypermobility uh, syndromes, as well as um, a little bit on pain in arthritis. So by all means, please go through those if you're seeing kids with some specific conditions. And then lastly, when to refer? What do I do if I have a family that I'm really struggling with trying to get them to get some help for it? And again, if I go back here to the toolkit, one of the things that we've done is put together a list of the tool, uh, the uh, pain clinics that are in Canada. I'm very happy to say, look at the number of pain clinics we now have for children in Canada. When I started 10 years ago, we had five and we are now at 11 uh, pediatric chronic pain clinics. Um, Nova, um, Manitoba, unfortunately, does not have one yet. They are working to get one going, and there's really only one um, for the um, East Coast provinces outside of uh, um, Nova Scotia. So again, all of the clinics do have, um, sadly, tremendous wait lists um, because of the epidemiology of chronic pain. Um, if you're in doubt, though, and you're in a family practice or a GP, I would suggest strongly referring them to a pediatrician for an initial referral, who then can also link up with the clinics as well. And when you click on um, the, the links to the clinics, you can find we all have certain stuff on our websites, um, some of the resources that are on our website. So surf around, find the one that's closest to you, and feel free to contact them if you have any questions. So in summary, I just want to say, please, please believe your patients. They don't want to be in front of you. They'd rather be in school. They'd rather be um, go hanging out with their friends or playing their sports. Um, they just really need some help in understanding why they have pain, what's going on. Do your judicious screening and make sure you've ruled out the big, bad, and the obvious. Um, and then if in doubt, refer them to a pain clinic. Thank you very much, Kathy. Great presentation and a nice walkthrough for the resources. We did put uh, a link to the to the pay, to the section on the Knowledge Exchange Network where the pain information is all the pain information, not just the chronic pain information. So everyone's encouraged to go there when you get a chance. So now, now we're going to go back to Sandy. Sorry for the mix up earlier, but I did just want to remind the audience: if you do have any questions for Kathy or any of our panelists, uh, we will be taking questions at the end. So please don't hesitate to type them in at any time during the presentation so that we have them ready. Uh, and now we're going to go over to Sandy Smink from the ILC Foundation. Yes, I was. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so I'd like to begin by saying thank you to everybody who has, uh, to CAPSI, 
all of the people who participated in creating this toolkit and everyone who's attending today um, to further uh, care for people with chronic pain. Um, you know, this toolkit can help to improve care and understanding. And at the community level, it's really about helping these children and youth be supported well in their communities at schools because someone has validated their very real chronic pain health issues, which is critically important. Um, the people who we communicate with and work with for our annual conference, the healthcare professionals are even talking about how difficult it is that there is even bullying in the workplace because why are you taking on these difficult patients? So this conversation is so important. It's going to help. Um, this is, I put together a slide for the um, work we do on um, advocating at the government level um, at communities across the country, really. So the prevalence of chronic pain, and we've included the prevalence of hypermobile EDS um, in here as well, really speaks to the need for a national pain strategy. This is um, Chelsea Clark. Chelsea Clark is somebody I've known for uh, probably 12, 15 years. She was on, she's a member of the, was a member of the Paralympic Team Canada, went to the Olympics, won medals. By the time she was diagnosed, she had end-stage cancer. In her case, because she had cerebral palsy, she was labeled as a mental health, um, requiring mental health support. Now, we can agree that living with chronic pain intersects mental health, but there needs to be a rigorous, really, evidence-based guidelines followed so that, so to avoid patients being labeled and moved through the psych psychological model of care without diagnostics being done. Um, and this is um, Dominic Boy then. Parents, children, youth, people of all ages, need a place that they can connect with their peers. CAPC provides that place for you as healthcare professionals. The ILC offers resources to connect these patients with their peers at the community level through the many different groups that exist across the country. And um, really just thank you very much for continuing the conversation and uh, providing care. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, um, so we're now going to go over to where we started, uh, uh, back to Ashley Townley at Holland Blurview in Toronto. Over to you, Ashley. Hey, thanks, Doug. Hi, everybody. Um, we are really motoring through this presentation, so um, hopefully we'll have um, some great questions and discussion for the end. So this has just been a brief overview of the things you can expect and maybe how you could potentially use these resources in your practice. But more broadly, what can you do to support the work of CAPC and specifically this chronic pain toolkit? So first thing, try using the toolkit. You don't have to use it all. Maybe take a gander and see if there's one or two things that speak to you, like the chronic pain letter that Kathy spoke about, or maybe some of the family resources like the videos that you could see sharing with your clients. Um, and again, give us feedback. Is it working for you? Is it missing something? Um, are there more background articles you'd like to see or more pain conditions that we could add under chronic pain? After that, I'd just like to say that a personal recommendation is worth a thousand tweets. Um, social media is really hot these days, and I think it's a great way to get out to the broader landscape of healthcare um, and to our clients and families. Um, but I'd never want to downplay the opportunities that we have on a personal level with our colleagues. Um, the research has shown that especially clinician to clinician from the same discipline, if you find something helpful, if you recommend it to your peer who's also a physician, a nurse, an OT, a PT, etc., they are so much more likely to take that under their wing and try using it as well. So if you have good things to say, please try sharing it with at least one other person. Second to that, share it with your practice network. So if you do find it useful or one or two items from it useful, um, share it broadly with your profession. 
And then also, depending on where you work, we would encourage you to bring it forward um, to, say, for example, your quality improvement committee. Maybe you can take on some pain projects around, um, you know, six-month pilot implementations of some of um, the tools or recommendations from this chronic pain toolkit. Um, also, your collaborative practice leaders. So if you uh, work in a hospital setting, um, you may have someone that heads up your profession. Um, you know, sharing the toolkit with them and saying, hey, you know, these are some best practices based on expertise and research evidence. Could you see incorporating this into our daily care? And then lastly, I'd also say, um, if you have a standard of care committee, um, what, you, what do you have around pain right now? Um, is there anything you could develop around acute and chronic pain as a standard of care um, for the context that you find yourself in? So that's really it for today. We want to thank everybody that's joined us. Um, it has been a brief overview, um, so we welcome any questions, comments, recommendations, or insights that you might have, um, and you can direct them to any one of us on the panel. So um, I'll open the floor to you. All right, thanks, Ashley. And uh, as Ashley said, please do uh, start typing in any questions that you do have. Um, we do have a, a few extra minutes. As Ashley said, we did motor through this fairly quickly. So uh, the first question that came in uh, was when you were speaking, Kathy, uh, you were talking about, you know, really stressing the importance of that uh, that that sort of medical history and background in, in sort of diagnosing and understanding that particular child's pain. What do you have any recommendations or any any comment on sort of the challenges of children with whether it be developmental delay, non-communicative or what have you, those children that are, are, are non-verbal or what, anything like, do you have any suggestions or recommendations around that sort of thing? Sorry. Um, there are some actually good tools that are uh, available for um, children who are un unable to communicate. So the non-communicating children's pain checklist, which is a good question, we should put it in the toolkit. Um, there's a non-communicating children's pain checklist um, that's for use for, there's two that have been developed, one for everyday pain, which is what we should put in in the chronic pain toolkit, and it looks at behaviors. The problem, of course, is for children who can't communicate, we're actually having to look at behaviors rather than asking them. So always, always, always try and get a verbal report. So even if a child has some developmental delay, if we can get some verbal report from them, we use it. And if we can't, then we look at the behaviors. And so the, the checklist looks at um, how well do they sleep? How well do they eat? How well do they move? Do they guard? certain spots in their body? Do they protect certain areas? Um, those sorts of things. So we will add that tool in. Thank you for asking about that. Um, we do know that kids with um, um, significant physical impairments, kids with cerebral palsy, often have more pain. Um, so having those tools available to help people uh, is important. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's Ashley, if I could just jump in here. Um, a little bit of sh shameless... <laughs> Shameless self-promotion on part of Holland, Holland Blue Review. Um, a, a resource that is actually now available on the Chronic Pain um, Toolkit through CAPC. If you scroll down the page under Website and Online Resources, there's something called the Chronic Pain Assessment Tool Toolbox for Children Thank with you. Disabilities. Um, and this is a four-part um, toolbox that addresses um, chronic pain assessment from uh, the narrative perspective. So we have the RNAO, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, their clinical practice guideline. Um, we have paired it with evidence and clinical expertise around assessing pain specifically in children with cerebral palsy. And then we have 15 chronic pain assessment tools that we um, found through a systematic review we did that address both chronic pain interference um, and chronic pain coping, of which one of them is the NCCPCR, which Kathy spoke to. Um, in terms of um, developmental delay and other proxy measures, one of the ones that's in there is the pediatric pain profile coming out of the UK, and that's a 20-item behavioral tool um, that has a, a, a cutoff score and then breaks down the pain from mild, moderate, um, and so forth um, to track pain over time. So, I think if you're looking at kids with, um, you know, cognitive challenges and um, issues in self-reporting their pain, um, this resource would be really great to take a look at. Thank you. I knew that was in there. <laughs> <laughs> and as you were talking, Kathy, Mar uh, one of our audience members, Marin, asked if we could expand further on chronic pain in children with severe disability who are nonverbal. I think we did that, but Marin, if we, if there are any other questions you have about that 
that we didn't cover in between Ashley and uh, and Kathy, please uh, don't hesitate to type in another question. Um, the next question uh, that came in was maybe uh, Sandy, maybe we could get you to sort of uh, give us your thoughts on this. People were, were asking about sort of the challenges in, in getting centers to recognize pain as being important and in particular chronic pain. And uh, some are commenting that it's, it's in, in part, at least, because it doesn't really have a, it's sort of nameless. It, it, does, it cuts mm -hmm. across different things. It's not something that you can really put a label on, like a disease or a, or a particular condition like cerebral palsy that you can identify and put in a bit of a box sort of thing, so to speak. Uh, how do you, from, a, from an advocacy, advocacy perspective that you would be so involved with, how do you get people to recognize pain as being important as opposed to just saying, well, you're in a hospital or you, you're, you're sick, so it's, it should be expected? Like, how do you get people to accept that it's important? Yeah, I, um, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think the big thing is, is that, you know, from our experience, when, when families call us for support, they've gone through many different specialists, they've gone, their family physicians are no longer um, interested, really, unfortunately, in providing support, they're at a loss. And they basically, the doctors say, we'll do anything, we'll refer you anywhere, just tell, I need direction from you. So we end up doing the, like, na uh, patient navigation services. So we're talking about what kind of pain they're experiencing, trying to identify you know, do they have neurogenic bladders? Do they have back pain? Do they have leg weakness? Are they tripping, falling? Um, trying to identify what those, um, uh, the physical things that could be going on in their bodies and giving a roadmap really of them identifying what could be going on and making sure that they get to see the right doctors. So from a prime, we, we go back to that primary care, um, the family physicians need to be better educated, um, physiotherapists, um, chiropractors, osteo, osteopaths, um, you know, there isn't one method of care that fits everyone. Um, so it really, it really comes down to um, advocating for educating at front line. And we've essentially pulled together multidisciplinary specialists within that talk to each other within a community um, about their patients. And, and that seems to help, but it, it really is a challenge. And identifying the problem, there are so, so many system, system health system issues. Um, there's not enough funding. Uh, so going to make presentations to the Provincial Neurosurgery Advisory Committee and to the College of Physicians and Surgeons, um, helping the patient understand how they can self-advocate. Those um, initiatives are really important, and that's what we basically help people to do um, so that they become better self-advocates and that the government, you know, our min health ministries need to understand Provincially and federally, but this is um, this is uh, a health concern and issue that is so unaddressed, leaving 29% of the population marginalized, and it affects every aspect of life. Um, you know, family breakdown happens, suicide ideology, suicide, um, the opioid crisis. I don't even want to talk about because it created a whole other area of of despair. So I think it really it comes down to mobilizing the patient population to not be fearful to speak out for their what they're not, the care they're not getting, and for an organization and others like the ILC to come together to coalesce on a very strong message that we need a national pain strategy. You're doing the best you can. Um, you know, from our experience, we came to the CAPC conference in 2012 as a gold sponsor, as a very small charity to open people's minds to the fact that kids do have pain and that there are chronic pain conditions that are not well understood. So um, advocating and if we can help you, which we are diligently trying to do, 
that really is, and getting the patients to have a place to come in the community uh, is important. Thank I you. Don't know. No, th no, thank, thank you for that uh, that response. And Ashley and Kathy, please don't hesitate to uh, jump in on any any of the questions. Um, one of the other uh, question that came in was uh, related to one of your slides, Kathy, where you list you you sort of pointed out the uh, incredible growth in the number of pain clinics across the country from I think you said four or five to eleven or so now. It looked uh, just glancing at that list, it looked like all were in major centers and probably all at children's hospitals or places like larger centers like Holland Bloorview. Uh, what would you suggest for those uh, children that don't live uh, in, in, in those large centers that have direct access to those major tertiary children's hospitals that are out in community centers that may not have access to that kind of expertise? Are there sort of networks are those are those major centers reaching out to other hospitals in any way to support sort of through networks through community hospitals and other providers or uh, yeah I, I hope we are and I think that's one of the reasons why we wanted to put this toolkit together I can tell you from our point of view we take kids from all over northern Alberta um, the territories northeastern BC our catchment area is absolutely huge and we welcome referrals um, from the huge catchment area, I would imagine that all of the children's hospitals do see kids from their catchment area. One of the things that we do try to help develop, and I know we use extensively here at our program, is using our telehealth technologies to, to link up with kids and families so that they don't have to come to the city for all of their, their care. They come initially to our program for an initial assessment in person so that we can complete a physical examination. And then after that, we use our technology so that they can link up um, without having to come to the city. And I think most of the children's hospitals would do the same thing. The other thing that um, we're, we're doing in Canada is developing online resources for kids and families, um, trying to look at app-based. There's a huge research project right now um, that we're involved with looking at development of an app for kids and families to, to be able to access wherever they are, um, trying to, to put it in their community so that they don't have to come here. But certainly if, if you've got a patient in your practice that, that you can't make a diagnosis of, you're just not sure what the diagnosis is, you've ruled out um, things such as arthritis or Crohn's or colitis, by all means, refer them to a pain clinic. And um, from most of the families that I have worked with over the past 10 years, they would have driven all night to come to our pain clinic if they had the opportunity to come and be seen in a clinic. So um, find out which ones are, are in your catchment area that would accept a referral and, and see if that family is willing to travel. Um, we also do have uh, airlines in Canada are very quite happy to help families um, attend children's hospitals if they need to. So we certainly could be using some of our partners to be able to get kids into the pain clinics when they need it. All right. Um, Jenna's asking if you can address chronic pain and opioid addiction and how to address chronic pain while being cognizant of the reality of addiction. And, and if I can just add, I actually just saw, I think it was in the New York Times the other day, they were yeah. reporting on an article that was published in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association yeah. about uh, the use of opioids versus non-opioid uh, medications in, in, in treating chronic pain and that there was no benefit to using opioids. That's just something I just saw recently. But can you, any of you on the panel, can you, uh, and Sandy, I think is already Already mentioned it, but uh, Kathy or Ashley, uh, any anything to add about the issue of opioid addiction and chronic pain, particularly as it relates to children? Um, I'll sort of wade into that deep, deep, deep pool, and I will just say that from a, a pediatric point of view, we have zero evidence. Um, and most of those, that was a fascinating study that came out in JAMA yesterday. It was the first one that actually looked at 12 months use of opioids and found some significant harms with very little benefit compared to using a non-steroidal. Um, certainly, if that's something that you are worried about with it, with someone um, before you start opioids, refer to a pain clinic would be my best advice for chronic pain conditions. Contact a pain clinic if you're wondering about whether or not that's something that you need to consider with a family. Um, and I know that CAFC has actually tried to advocate at the national level going, you know, kids are not little orphans and we don't have any research in that area. All right. Any other, anyone else from the panel? Uh... Uh, if this is Sandy. I, I guess I would add that, you know, we, you, you don't think about um, using opioids doesn't, probably happen with the children population, but in the youth population, um, if it's providing a degree of a quality of life so that they can attend some of their classes, 
it is there is um, the patient experience that it there is benefit, and it's so important to look at um, use the use of opioids for quality of life, and then therefore it becomes dependency as opposed to addiction, and. You know, that's one of the topics that we talk about through the Chronic Pain Care Forum with the the DeGroote McMaster National Pain Centre, is that we have to take a very strong look at teasing out the difference um, because there is there is an application for use use of opioids and medical cannabis to help these people have um, a degree of a quality of life. Uh, so you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, no, but you don't want to do done. it at the primary care level, really. That, no, and and that, yeah. that would be my my concern is let's not do this at the primary care level. Yeah. All right. And speaking of cannabis, that was Agreed. the next yeah. that, uh, that came in was from Aaron, who's just uh, commenting that with the upcoming legisla- uh, legalization of, of marijuana for recreational use, what are your thoughts regarding increased use for pain control amongst adolescent patients? And whether that be uh, through prescribed m- medical marijuana prescribed for pain or just accessing, you know, the recreational marijuana to manage their own pain, uh, maybe even without the input of a, of a, of a physician. Uh, any, any comments on that from the cannabis perspective? My recommendation would be to follow the recommendations of the Canadian Pediatric Society with regards to use of marijuana in children, which it is not recommended. I think the Health Canada, Canada standards are under 25, right, Kathy? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, we actually had a, a panel of experts uh, that uh, CAFC put together to help uh, inform some of the some of the uh, discussions at the Senate. Um, we had some individuals from across physicians from across the country, and they was, one of them was really commenting that there isn't any evidence that cannabis is very good at pain control in the first place. So there's still some lots of lots of research to be, to be done on cannabis still, and particularly as it relates to children, for sure. Um, so, uh, we do, uh, as, uh, Ashley mentioned, we did uh, go through the presentation fairly quick. We have gone through all of the questions that we have. If anyone has any last questions that you're trying to, uh, get into the question box quickly before we, uh, wrap up, maybe a couple minutes early, we will do that. Otherwise, if, as we're waiting, maybe we can get our panelists to think about any closing comments that they would like to, uh, leave the audience with any key messages you'd like to send the audience off with as we wrap up. And I, I don't see any other questions coming in. So, uh, maybe we'll start with, uh, start with Sandy and, uh, uh, we'll go down the list, Sandy, Kathy, and then we'll end with uh, our, our community practice co-chair, Ashley, at the end. Um, so, Sandy, anything you'd like to leave the audience with, any comment or uh, key message you'd like to leave the audience with before we wrap up? Um, I guess because we have the focus of um, allergy danlos syndrome as well as chronic pain, and the prevalence of EDS is much greater than what was in originally anticipated, I would ask anybody on the call that has patients that have um, multiple system pain issues, if you can't connect the issues, um, think connective tissues, <laughs> um, go on our website. We have uh, many, many YouTube videos from healthcare, uh, from specialists that speak to the GI issues, the POTS, um, mast cell activation, all of those things um, increase when they're not managed well, they increase the level of pain that the patient is feeling. And so from an anecdotal point of point of view, you know, it's because that's where we come from, it's uh, it's really important to think about those things. And if you're interested in becoming involved with any with our annual conference and um, providing resources from your own communities, please do send the connections to us so that we can add them to our website and do the social media thing of tweeting and (laughs) sharing the resources that you provide as healthcare professionals. But other than that, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Sandy. And uh, uh, anything from you, Kathy, any closing messages you'd like to leave the audience with? Um, just um, primary care is huge. Um, I know in primary care, you're going to be seeing these kids. I can't stress enough the importance about listening to them, believing them, their pain is real. Um, and then put together some simple strategies to help them manage their pain. 
give them a good explanation of what's happening in their body, why they have pain, how hurt does not necessarily equal harm, and and then help them get their life back on track. Um, Don't be afraid to refer them to a pain clinic. Don't be afraid to refer them to a psychologist. Please refer them to a physiotherapist. Find the resources that are in your area. And if you're in doubt, contact one of the pain clinics. We'd happily help you navigate this system for kids and families. All right. Thank you very much for that. And uh, for the last word, we'll go to Ashley Townley. Over to you, Ashley. Thanks, Doug. Um, I just want to say I'm super heartened by the passion um, that folks have for pain. Um, The more it's coming uh, to light, especially through my work um, with CAPC. I'm super excited about that. Um, and I guess from my perspective as a knowledge broker, uh, someone that implements these types of um, toolkits and practice is is often I hear from folks that they're um, afraid to get it wrong because they don't want to fail any of their families, which I totally understand. Um, but I'm here to say that try it. And if you don't get it right the first time, that's okay. But um, to keep trying, you know, pick something from the chronic pain toolkit that you would like to try in your practice, give it a shot for six months. And if it doesn't work out, try something else. Um, and, you know, reach out to CAPC um, if you need if you need some more support um, um, or more information around that. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we're on the right track um, to start addressing chronic pain um, more for our kids and our families. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you, Doug. And to all three of you, Ashley, Kathy, and Sandy, it was a great presentation and great work by the entire community of practice, many of you in the audience uh, that have participated in this work all along the way. So really, it's uh, it's been a five years of, of work, and, and it's really come to a, a great conclusion with a number of great resources on the Knowledge Exchange Network. So once again, I encourage everyone to go there and check all that information out. And as Ashley said, if you do have any questions, either contact our panelists or just contact us at CAFC, and we'd be happy to put you in touch with the folks who do have the information that you might be looking for. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. Uh, we do our webinars usually every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and when you uh, get to watch, you get to ask your questions and and provide your comments and really enrich the discussion. But when you can't watch live, we do record these sessions and make them after available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network. And we encourage you to uh, share all of the uh, links to the videos uh, and previous webinars with your colleagues uh, or with anyone who's not able to join us live. Um, and as I said, we usually do our webinars every Wednesday, but uh, we are taking a bit of a break for about three weeks. We have a, a number of uh, March breaks across the country, and I'm in fact taking a vacation of my own in a couple weeks. Uh, so we will be taking about three three weeks off. We'll be back on April, uh, I believe it's April 4th, uh, Wednesday, April 4th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time with another presentation from our complex care community of practice. So there'll be lots of more information coming out in the Tuesday uh, CAFC Presents email newsletter. Uh, So please do keep an eye on that for information about the uh, next webinars, uh, which will be April 4th. And then we will be back on our regular schedule after that. So thanks again for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you back here in April. Bye, everyone.